Dead Space is a groundbreaking horror that... Uh, wait a second. Dead Space was a groundbreaking horror that raised the bar across the entire genre. As discussed by Glenn Schofield, the game's original creator, in an interview with Ars Technica, the first game openly took its cues from a number of successful horror franchises in a bid to create the scariest game ever made. You, know, you have to go in and, and go, I want to make the scariest game ever. Right, you don't go in and say, I want to make the third scariest. Examples of these include Resident Evil 4's famous over-the-shoulder perspective that debuted just three years earlier, or Silent Hill's psychological horror aspect that left absolutely no room for comedy relief. And that was doubled down by influences from the mind-bending abstract movie Solaris. Your wife, she's dead. And then there was the body horror, the sort of grotesque gore popularized by David Cronenberg and Peter Jackson. And most importantly, the undeniable influence, if not practically the blueprints of the ship from Event Horizon. But everything's influenced by something, and this wouldn't go on to define Dead Space. The question remained, after blending those grand crew ingredients, what fresh flavors did Dead Space bring to the table? Pun intended. And the answer is a lot. Right off the bat, there was the inspired combat system that had you hacking the limbs off enemies with futuristic engineering tools. Going into pretty much any other shooter these days, as a rule of thumb, we all know that the head is the sweet spot. So when Dead Space encouraged something other than headshots, it was, and amazingly still is, pretty novel. This served not just to amplify the carnage, which it definitely did, but it made each enemy a macro puzzle as you decided on the fly whether to knock their legs off as they staggered towards you, or perhaps take their arms out if they were close and winding up for an attack. It was an original and exciting concept that remains a breath of fresh air. Then there were the unforgettable set pieces that squeezed every ounce of tension out of the industrial environments of the USG Ishimura, moving between dark, claustrophobic corridors lined with bleak alien hardware to the sepia-infused open areas reminiscent of control rooms found on the mightiest of seafaring vessels. The thundering engine room in particular had players panicking despite ultimately turning out to be a monster-free zone. Then you open the door and it's just a and people are running in the room. They are just trying to get out of that room. It's so awesome. The animators have perfected the art of this frightening spider-like movements with the enemies, as well as the macabre death scenes, built from the ground up to maximize believability as the severed body part matched up with where the enemy struck you. And then there was the interface, purposefully devoid of any information so as to enhance the immersion, which meant the designers had to cleverly reassign all the standard bits found on the HUD. Hold still, Isaac. I'm sinking up everyone's rig with the ship. First, we had the health bar on the spine, which was explained away as being part of an outfit called a rig, worn by everybody on the ship to manage their comms and relay their physical well-being and provide access control and so on. What might have stumped the designers was instead integrated into the world building, enhancing the aesthetic of the NPCs in the game. The ammunition count was a hologram that popped up on the weapon as Isaac would see it, along with a menu interface that lightly reflected what was projected from your chest unit, and to top it off, the legendary navigation laser that led you to your next objective. It wasn't just one or two things, it was a suite of gameplay mechanics that was so fresh, you really did feel like you were stepping 500 years into the future and getting to grips with tomorrow's world technology. And the new Dead Space? Well, for the most part, it's very similar. It's beautifully reimagined with stellar graphics, bone-crunching sound effects, and enough audio ambience to fuel a rocket ship, as any fan of the original might hope. So yeah, in short, it's pretty good. Rather than being built in the original Havoc engine, it's now built in EA's Frostbite engine, and it might strike returning players as very similar in the mind's eye, but when you compare like for like, you can appreciate how beautiful and time-striking the new game actually is. Lighting technology in particular has come leaps and bounds in 15 years, and this has been leveraged to a far larger extent when contrasting between the scenes that incite calm and those that don't. However, where the original game was bursting at the seams with innovation. Those aspects that have been carried over are, of course, no longer innovations 15 years later. Some improvements are subtle, some are overt, and other aspects have been left well alone, which will no doubt divide players. Before we get into the nitty gritty, it's worth noting that despite the epic release week praise, it's actually not without its faults. I've heard good things about the PC release, but my experience relates to the PS5. The center pad on the PS5 brings up your rig length menu, and you can close it with circle or B on the Xbox. 
Problem is, a bug sometimes results in the game failing to recognize it's open, and so pressing circle would default to the standard function, which is to use the medkit. I don't need to tell you how frustrating it is when your single precious medkit is wasted on an already full health bar. Frustrating enough to reload your last save, I can tell you that much. Reassigning the buttons didn't help either, as different movesets have crossover functionality with the buttons. But I'll let it go, as it only happened about, like, uh, a dozen times start to finish. And then there's the mysterious disappearing enemies conundrum. What does one do when a game that's already scary makes the enemies disappear and all pickups drop through the floor and walls? But to be fair, that one only happened a couple of times near the start, so possibly it's already been patched. But at a whopping 65 pounds or 70 US dollars, these types of bugs are not really appreciated on release day. The bugs are boring, so moving on, I want to talk about the changes made to the game and those that were left well alone. All changes were, of course, a design choice, and each one was a gamble as they needed to consider the very real destructive power of the original fan base dragging the score down on release. With that in mind, let's look at the aspects of the game that they chose to preserve rather than enhance. In a clear effort to safeguard as much of the original feel of the game as they could, Isaac's clunky movements haven't been touched. Some might argue they didn't need to be. The original was a cornerstone of horror gaming and it's aged pretty well. But nevertheless, we see a return of some of the original scenes in which his sluggish movements will have you biting your knuckles to the bone as he meanders slowly around enemies and deadly environmental puzzles with absolutely no sense of urgency. At some point, this will get you killed and you want to throw the control at the screen, assuming you haven't already squeezed the sprint button so hard it punched through the bottom of the pad. You see, Isaac doesn't dodge. He just butches his enemies with vengeance and takes any licks they might get in like a champ. It's what he did in 2008, and it's what he does now. But in 2008, when Dead Space was rewriting the rules for what constituted good action horror, it actually added movement to the Resident Evil 4's stand and aim system. I want to be running and shooting. I want to get away from the character. Um, so that's what we did. That just was a nice place to innovate. So it was innovating at the time. The clunky movements were still, in theory, an update on the current standard. And a lot of people said, well, can't we just go with the standard shooter control scheme? And then there was another camp that said, well, you have to have that. You know, you're not a space marine. And now, with 15 years of game development between them, it's much more obvious that he lacks a dodge move or a quick turnaround move. But this is an observation, not a complaint, because the game has rightly been praised for keeping so true to the original. Yet when you compare the Resident Evil remakes, which to be fair had 23 years between them, the difference is night and day. <laughs> You're right! When Capcom rooted Leon on the spot when aiming in Resident Evil 4, despite the obvious lack of realism, we all applauded it because it both enhanced the tension, but also stayed true to the source material. And when Capcom finally relented and integrated moving while aiming and, more importantly, dodge rolls into 2012's Resident Evil 6, despite the fact that this was probably a realistic addition to the moveset, it was universally hated on as fans felt it was the final nail in the coffin for a series moving away from survival horror and into full-fledged action. I mean, dodge rolls themselves literally played their part in ending the original franchise. It was that bad. Dead or alive, you are coming with me. So retaining Isaac's clunky Robocop footsteps as he plods around is probably a very sensible choice, and I agree with it, but I'd be super game to hear your thoughts if you fancy popping them down in the comments. Now, when it comes to the ship, the animated scenery that was unique to the area you were in was always a mainstay for the series. From creatures grabbing you through windows to huge asteroids hurtling past the windows on the bridge. The world felt alive around you, these distractions were often brilliantly intertwined with jump scares so as to catch you off guard. This fundamental aspect of the remake is as ever-present as it was. The ship feels like a functioning machine, with systems ticking away or even going haywire in the background, and jump scares are organically, pun intended, integrated into your path. Now this is horror in its purest form, and where other titles might use cheap jump scares to distract from an otherwise lacking atmosphere, Dead Space successfully piles these on top of an already tense experience to further enrich the already terrifying environment. Now, when it comes to what they did change, some updates are subtle, and others are pretty obvious. So let's look at the ones that aren't overtly obvious. 
EA Motive developed what they call an intensity director to keep you on your toes. Essentially, things like how well you're doing or how long you're exploring a certain area can trigger dynamic enemy events, ensuring that you never rest easy. The original did actually have dynamic events in so much as the enemies could enter the area via different access points depending on the player's position. Then there are the new areas added to the map. Some might be subtle additions like storage rooms with ammo, so subtle that frankly you probably wouldn't even notice unless you're intimately familiar with the original game. Others are more obvious, like a room found off the bridge that has information about the red marker and serves to better flesh out the world. Where Isaac would once simply gaze at a wall in zero gravity and leap over to it, now we have the free flight controls that debuted in Dead Space 2. They were a little clunky then and they're still a little clunky now, but they're a welcome addition either way. These types of changes were organic evolutions of the game as the design team learned from player feedback. Now, as a result, this isn't the only change integrated from the sequel. Other examples include the absolutely awesome, but otherwise slightly useless, alternate fire for the pulse rifle. The application for a spinning turret gun was far more limited than the mine launcher that replaced it in the 2011 sequel, and so the remake went for the remote mine from the outset. The weapon upgrade tree has also been tweaked, albeit only slightly, with the player now needing to invest or find specific weapon parts in order to progress the upgrade trees and gain access to new features. Although a novel concept, I found the additional features to be so slight that it barely affected the game, but with 15 years of gaming evolution between them, these are exactly the sorts of enhancements that I like to see in order to further enrich the experience. And then we have the infamous turret gun missions that were, for lack of a better word, a total faff, and these have also been scrapped. Mini games are always hit and miss anyway, and in this case it was widely accepted by the fans to be a low point in the game. EA picked up on this and rightly simplified the replacement by turning it into a calibration exercise. So, another win for Dead Space 2023. Moving on to the more obvious changes, we have Isaac's voice. We're gonna fix this, Hammond. For them. This is a big one. Isaac was a silent protagonist in the original, by choice. The main character, Isaac, was not gonna talk. You had to try and make a character that didn't talk not look like he was always just taking orders. Of course, this was other than his awesome grunts as he enacted Operation Ground and Pound. Or when the enemy chose to enact this on him. Usually, I love protagonists who don't speak as it allows the player to embody the character. I mean, he's wearing a helmet, so even his sex and age are obscured for most of the game, making him that much more accessible to gamers around the world. Now, though? Well, Gunnar Wright, who voiced Isaac in the original 2011 sequel, is back. Daniels and I can handle it in 48 hours, Max. And actually, he's great. He's the face of Isaac, too, which fits nicely as he appears lean and athletic, which is how I imagine a 40-something-year-old space engineer might look. His wife, Nicole, has been dutifully remodeled after her voice actress, Tanya Clark, and your leader, Hammond, after Anthony Alibi. A hilarious backlash after the promotional video surfaced had armchair warriors claiming that EA butchered your teammates, especially Kendra, by making her, I quote, less womanly. Dead Space, the remake, has quite frankly uglifying them as they like to do because society does not like pretty women in video games. Yes, that's right, nerds, she lost her F-cups. But the truth is, the characters are probably the best overhaul in the game. The voice acting is great, with no memorable exceptions. And to top that off, Isaac's voice actually features two recordings for each scene depending on his health level, with Wright dropping extra grunts and gasps into the dialogue if he's wounded. I mean, come on, that is freaking awesome. I don't know any other game that does that. Their specific stories have been distinctly reworked to make their motives more believable, while still reaching similar milestones and conclusions as the original. In fact, if you only have a surface memory of their actions from the 2008 game, you might not even notice the changes. And on that note, a New Game Plus mode also offers an alternate ending, further encouraging replayability. But most importantly, for the most part, Isaac keeps his trap shut, with no out-of-place cursing to ruin the immersion, which is a godsend and a tribute to the redesign actually understanding the reason for the original decision. Gunner Wright handles the cutscenes, you handle everything else. A single exception to this, in my humble opinion, is that he could have spoken to or about his wife, Nicole, just a little bit more. Having traveled across hyperspace to find and rescue her, you'd expect him to wrap her in a steel blanket and not leave her side, especially considering the unending slaughter that ensues as you navigate the ship. I mean, he does talk to her and he is obviously concerned, but I desperately hope that they'd find another way to better explain how she kept herself alive. Go, I'll reprogram the shuttle. Despite this, as is necessary for the narrative to continue, he was oddly indifferent to her doing her own thing. 
Another updated aspect of the game is the open world map if we can call it that. The issue Mora is no longer broken down into levels, but instead the various areas are made accessible by necessity as your teammates override locks or when you scavenge access cards and rigs from the dead crew. Conceptually, this may have been great on paper, but in reality, I only found myself revisiting past areas when I realized late game that I had side quests available. Something that passed me by as it hadn't existed in the original and I was too busy going objective to objective trying to survive. For sure this one's on me, but hey, I didn't clock it until later game, and as a result, during a fairly tense finale that puts Isaac under blatant time pressure, Kendra, we're out of time. I was instead plodding around literally the entire ship, area after area, hunting for level 3 security rooms and stocking up on goodies. Of course this type of immersion breaking trope wasn't intended when they made the Ishimura open world, but if I hadn't been obliged to revisit past areas for these extra added side missions, I'm not sure why I would want to, as the enemies continue to spawn and chip away at your health. On the flip side, loading areas are now non-existent if you stick to two-legged transport. And using the tram to speed up travel does have Isaac studying graffiti for a few seconds, but it still never presents a loading screen, and this type of next-gen framework is just awesome as tension never lets up. The segments that had you squeeze through narrow areas, which were a popular method of masking a loading screen around about the 2008 period, are also a thing of the past. Except at one point. The fact that they chose to include one and it played out the way it did, well, it's as close to a wink from the developers as I think you can get. The security access also keeps certain storage lockers under lock and key until later game, and this presents a clever way of drip feeding you necessary supplies as you pass through the same areas later game. Now these are all evolutions on the 2008 version, but despite feeling natural, they actually weren't in the original game. And speaking of that, another fresh bit of innovation is the circuit breakers. Best not to focus on them too long, as you'll probably find yourself wondering what the hell they've been doing for the last 500 years that results in such a ropey bit of hardware running a starship. But the crux of it is you get to choose what to disable in order to reassign the power and progress. You can disable the oxygen, which puts a time limit on your back and adds an unnecessary extra heap of tension. Or you can turn off the lights, which, you know, is the freaking lights. This is really scary. All in all, it adds a majorly welcome dynamic to the already established maps that were lifted from the original. And talking about dynamic as the models of the enemies in the game, I think it's fair to say that there wasn't much improvement that could be done on the animations, as they were pretty flawless at the time, but this time around weapons like the force gun or the flamethrower will rip the flesh clean off the enemies, leaving them looking like something from a Body Worlds exhibition. It's an aspect that you know they would have included in the 2008 version if they could, and while it might be subtle, it's a great update, very much in keeping with the original. I think it's a rare thing, what we're seeing here. 15 years has seen extensive technical advancements to the industry, and these are enough to provide a greatly enhanced experience, but simultaneously it's not been long enough that gaming standards have changed to the extent that we get an entirely reimagined experience, like, say, with Resident Evil 2. But because the game has been built entirely new from the ground up, it's free of any frustrating throwbacks or missed elements. To put this in perspective, the original Alan Wake was released in 2010, just two years after the first Dead Space. The remaster came out just a year before the Dead Space remaster. So it's a similar kind of window, but Alan Wake was literally a pathetic HD reskinning of the original game, and if you chose to get close enough to some of the environments, you could see the old school textures winking at you, just bits they didn't update because they hoped you wouldn't notice. And yet we were supposed to buy it at full price. And so whether or not you feel Dead Space is dated enough to need a remake, or indeed if they did right by the original fans versus newcomers by preserving any dated aspects of the game in order to safeguard what made the original the powerhouse that it was, you have to see it for what it is in context. And what it is, is a true to the original, highly polished and ultimately very satisfying shooter that for once actually feels like it was made by the fans of the original, for the fans of the original, and simultaneously is such a complete retelling of a classic that you can safely say to any newcomers that they should be playing the remake rather than going old school for the sake of being a purist. EA might well have a reputation for putting profit before passion, but in the case of this remake, they've done the world of gaming proud. I am desperate to get to a thousand subs so YouTube will actually start paying me, so if you could find it in yourself to hit that like button or maybe even subscribe, I would be so, so grateful. Thank you so much. Take care of yourself. Peace out. And hopefully see you next time.